Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hopefully you're having an amazing day. I want to kick this video off discussing NVIDIA, specifically news concerning their graphics card plans moving into early part of next year. There's one thing we can say about NVIDIA, they do not like to be behind their competition, which at the moment is predominantly, of course, AMD, but they will also be facing stiff competition eventually from Intel with uh, Intel's HPG lineup of GPUs, which of course is going to be initially Alchemist. And yeah, I think that NVIDIA right now are really making sure that they are in the best position possible. Hong Sing 2020 has stated that there's going to be three graphics cards which launch in January for desktop, just to be clear. 3090 Super, the 3070 Ti 16GB, and finally the 2060 12GB. Let's take the 2060 one first because I think that's probably going to be the quickest to discuss. This card is almost certainly going to be a GPU which is really designed to tackle the RX 6600 when it finally launches, which has eight gigabytes of memory, and of course, possibly even the 6600 XT as well. Now, to my knowledge, the 6600 is going to definitely be slower than any of NVIDIA's graphics cards from the Ampere lineup right now, but obviously the GPU hasn't launched, so performance targets and stuff can only really be believed when you're actually seeing reviews, of course. But yeah, the super series of cards from NVIDIA are perhaps the most interesting because, well, for a start, there's only going to be one super series card which launches according from Hong Sing, and that is the 3090 Super. Indeed, even the name, the 3090 Super, I'm hearing is a little ambiguous. I believe there's a possibility that this could actually be a Titan class card when it launches just purely for marketing reasons. Obviously, Ampere doesn't currently have a Titan flagship. But then again, it's also possible that NVIDIA might just skip it for the Ampere generation. Names can basically be decided quite late in the production cycle of a GPU. Although, of course, you do need to give AIBs, for example, time to kind of do like box art and all of that stuff. But still, just something to be aware of. The 3090 Super, and I'm going to refer to it as such for the rest of this video, has 10,752 CUDA cores. So this is the full enabled GA102 die. So it's GA102400. So this is up slightly from the 10,496 found in the 3090, which is GA102-300. So the real difference here, of course, is you have a few additional CUDA cores, but also, there's going to allegedly be a higher clock frequency. At least that's what the rumor is. Now, how much higher that clock frequency is, I honestly don't know. I've heard some to say that it's not that much higher indeed, whereas others are saying it could even be 100 megahertz, 200 megahertz. And this is allegedly one of the reasons that the Super Series, again, assuming that's what they end up being called, has considerably higher power consumption than regular Ampere. Frankly, I'll be very interested to see how the heat is dissipated from all of this. And I kind of look forward to trying out the Super Series just, just out of kind of curiosity. Again, flagship cards, they may perhaps not make sense to everyone, but they're fun if nothing else. And there's also something else too. I think that this could, and again, this is theory based upon what we've been seeing in terms of the rumors, this could also be NVIDIA trying to do some prep work for their move forward with Lovelace, which again is supposed to be really power hungry, but bloody fast. Like the performance targets for Lovelace I'm hearing could be like 2.3 to 2.5 times faster than the 3090. But of course, Lovelace isn't released for about another year. So NVIDIA releasing some type of refresh in the short term makes sense. So this card again is allegedly going to launch in January and I personally have a really good source who pretty much tells me they are 99% certain that the mobile parts will definitely be announced in January, but they've heard nothing about the desktop derivatives. Now, this doesn't mean that it's untrue, just that I personally cannot verify it with my own sources, and I've spoken to a few people at this point. But with that said, Grayman and Kopity7 Kimi typically are pretty accurate, and both of them have said in the past that they've heard about the 
1390 super i'm not going to say super in every one of these because you're probably going to want to just like scream so just add super in your mind 1390 80 70 and finally 60 but again we're only seeing hong sing mention the 3090 super the 3070 ti 16 gigabyte which is basically the same card as the 3070 but um with 16 gigabytes and again just to reiterate the 2060 there are other cards here you can see a nice specification comparison which have uh, been compiled by videocards.com i won't read out all of them the one card that I'm perhaps most interested in, actually, in this lineup is the 3080 Super. As, again, it's not a great deal many CUDA cores, around 250, 256 to be precise, over the 3080. But the primary drive of performance here, other than perhaps an increase in clock frequency, is the additional memory bandwidth. Because, obviously, correspondingly, if you increase the uh, amount of memory just with NVIDIA cards and how they're configured like this anyway you naturally have a wider memory bus. Now, it's possible, of course, that NVIDIA could also reduce the clock frequency of the memory, but I don't think they will. So this means that the card A has more memory, but B also more memory bandwidth. So from my perspective, it will be quite fascinating to test out the 3080 Super, especially when it comes to higher resolution gaming with ray tracing and all of that jazz running. But yeah, I think next year is going to be crazy in tech because obviously we're going to be getting so many awesome releases and I very much look forward as well to seeing what NVIDIA um, will be facing off with from both AMD and Intel. The final piece of news for today that I'd like to cover is actually alleged leaked prices of Intel's 12th generation products. Of course, we are referring here to Alder Lake. Now, the release date for Alder Lake is going to be November, almost certainly, with the launch of it allegedly going to be the fourth. However, we possibly are going to see the sale of the processors go a little bit earlier, well, at least available for pre-order. And there are a couple of leaks we've had for prices but the latest is from Amazon. Now, again, I want to stress that A, these products are not released yet, so Intel could end up changing the prices even if these are correct, like last minute. They could be like, you know what, I'm going to add like $500 to one of these prices, or they could shave the price to like 5% of what I'm about to go through. Of course, it's unlikely they're going to cut it down so much, but there you go. I'd like to give credit to Momomo on Twitter, who I follow, and I think you should too for actually plonking all of these prices together. So I'm going to go through the GBP prices, Great British Pound, because quite frankly, I'm more familiar with them. So the 12900K is, and I'm going to be rounding up figures here or down figures just for all of our sanity. So it's around uh, 800 Great British Pounds for the 12900K. However, the KF uh, is going to cost you 750 uh, great British pounds. Meanwhile, the 12700K is 550, so you're basically saving 200 uh, pounds. And then, of course, you've got the KF version of the 12700, which honestly kind of is a large price difference, but there you go. And then finally, you've got the 12600K, which is basically 300 uh, pounds. There's also prices uh, too that we've seen from a Dutch Amazon. So for Dutch, we're looking at around 850. And of course, this also can be reflected in all of the other prices. Now, I don't really feel I need to say to you guys that that's a little more expensive than what I was hoping for. And it really does make me wonder what AMD are going to charge for Zen 4 when it finally does launch. I don't think those CPUs are going to be cheap. My prediction, and I again i stress that prices can change last minute and this is not based on a source this is just me spitballing here guessing but my prediction is that we're probably going to see the v cash ryzen's possibly be more expensive than this at least the 16 core versions and i think that amd for the lower end zen freeze for example the 5600s I think we're probably going to see them cut the prices so it could be a situation where we basically see intel sandwiched between uh, AMD's set of products. It'll be very interesting to see how all of this plays out though in the market. 
I'm also hearing from a couple of people now that the motherboards, when they finally go on sale, well, I'm hearing they can be quite expensive. Just to remind you guys, one of the major selling points, in air quotes, of Alder Lake is that it's going to have not just DDR5, but also PCIe Gen 5. Now, Zen 4 does not have that for AM5. It does not. There were some early rumors that it did have Gen 5, but I don't know whether those rumors were, well, just wrong, or whether AMD decided to go back on this and basically stick to Gen 4. Now, the reason I was told that Intel went with Gen 5 is basically to show that they're still a tech powerhouse. The reason I'm hearing that AMD didn't is because it does increase board costs. You can also make a lot of arguments that you don't really need it for, let's say, a desktop uh, system. Uh, if you're going HEDT, you know, maybe the next generation Threadripper processors or servers, obviously, you can certainly argue about Gen 5. And, you know, there's a whole thing about, let's say, for networking and Gen 5 storage if you're kind of building that type of system. But, you know, if you're gaming or even doing 4K video editing in most scenarios, you don't need it. Uh, th yeah, that's really simplifying the explanation, of course. But yeah, it's going to be very interesting to me how Intel actually market these processors. I suspect that the 12900K, for example, is going to be heavily pushed, heavily touted by Intel for its single thread prowess, but also for things like gaming. And I'm going to be very interested to see how it scales across different operating systems. So that's Windows 10 and 11, obviously, but also other operating systems such as Linux, but across different applications. So again, games are an obvious one, but also other things like video editing, content creation, you know, even compiling Google Chrome or whatever the hell you're doing. It's going to be very interesting to see how those, you know, performance or big and small cores that actually end up kind of helping or hindering. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. I'll see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.